Postmortem results on COVID victims strongly suggest that a clotting or a coagulation problem is something that really needs to be managed, which confirms clinical findings. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Chris Martinson here with your SARS-CoV-2 daily update, a.k.a. the honey badger virus. Why? Because this thing will escape any enclosure you try to keep it in, and it's really vicious once it gets inside your body. Uh, It's just an incredible foe. So let's get right to the numbers here. Here's what we have today as of about 4 o'clock here on April 14th, closing in on 2 million cases worldwide, and uh, the United States with over 1,700 deaths showing up in a single uh, moment here. The United States uh, closing in on um, you know more than a, a 25% of the total cases worldwide here. And what's interesting is only 12,000 serious or critical. That's a, an extraordinary death rate given that level of serious or critical. Um, I haven't seen any numbers getting close to that in any other circumstances. So uh, that's that's uh, pretty pretty strong right there, except maybe in the UK where I, I don't get this either. How do you have 778 deaths with 1,500 people and serious or critical? Uh, normally, you would see these numbers uh, much more elevated, and you would have perhaps uh, 15% of these people progressing from serious or critical, um, you know, over the over the course of the disease into into death. But a uh, very high death number here is relative to serious or critical. So don't know what that means yet. China moving down the list, and uh, what's it down to now? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seventh place here with its ever so unbelievable numbers. Um, we'll see what those really mean uh, over time. You know, this is one way to look at it, and uh, it's probably also useful to look at this when we adjust for the size of the population. Because does it? What does it really mean that the United States has eighteen thousand? new cases showing up uh, compared to Spain's 2,000. Well, if we compare this, let's look at how many cases are being noted per 1 million of population. I just reorganized this table. So this is the total cases in column 1 here. And then in column 2 is how many cases they have per 1 million of population. Uh, UAE on the top here, even though they only have 4,900 cases, they don't have uh, the population's not that big. So that works out to the equivalent of 65,000 cases per 1 million. By the way, as a reminder, 10,000 into a million is 1%. So this is about where 1% of your population, not about, the 10,000 mark is where 1% of your population is uh, has been identified as having been uh, an active carrier of COVID-19. So on this basis, so you sort of see how the rankings go here. The United States is uh, down here relative now. Uh, actually below Russia. Um, Interestingly enough, Russia is moving up quite smartly in this uh, whole story right here. We see them with uh, 2,000 cases here uh, moving up pretty strongly. And um, it's going to be very difficult to contain this virus in a lot of these countries uh, because, and in particular countries that don't have strong uh, government responses to help their populations stay in quarantine, feel like they were going to be fed, not starve, all kinds of things like that, unless you have really, really strong governmental control it's difficult to get people to stay in quarantine for all that long until you get your arms around this and then you can implement the kinds of testing and contact tracing that you need to do in order to be able to prevent the spread of the disease. All right, Uh, we're going to move on now to the pathology findings that came out of um, the autopsy from four decedents, these people out of uh, New Orleans, I believe, and it's pretty interesting. So you're, we're going to get a little, a little, uh, a little biology here. Uh, we're going to get a little histology, and uh, we're going to talk about what the implications of all this are. This is pretty interesting. What we're seeing in this, uh, in these findings. And again, this is just from four. We only had uh, two in the last um, autopsies out of China. I don't have a lot of autopsy data. I'd, I'd love to see this with hundreds uh, in this particular um, column here, so that we would know more about what's going on. All right. So uh, from the discussion of this paper down here, they said the dominant process in all cases was consistent with diffuse alveolar damage. So the alveoli are, of course, those little sacs in the lungs, diffuse damage. So it's uh, all over the place. With a mild to moderate mononuclear response consisting of notable CD4 plus aggregates. Um, These are your T-cells here, so notable T-cells coming in. Remember, we talked yesterday about the fact that the CD4 and 8 cells can both, both T-cells there, uh, can actually get this virus directly in through a second 
receptor that they carry on the outside, the CD147 receptor. So at any rate, we're seeing a, a lot of these uh, mild to moderate response here. Uh, you know, they're showing up in the lungs around thrombosed small vessels. So a fancy term here, this clot, a thrombosed, it means that there's a clot in the small vessel. So, so we're seeing these cells, these T cells showing up around clots, they're saying here, and significant associated hemorrhage. Now, a lot of these uh, uh, T cells here, they can, they mediate the immune response and they can also mediate the cytokine response and they can also mediate um, the process of uh, seeing that cells who are full of virus end up getting killed. Um, and if that happens, uh, it's possible that, that the, the alignment of these cells around these clotted small vessels and the significant hemorrhage means that these small vessels are really getting clobbered maybe by our own T-cells. Um, maybe the T-cells are seeing virus in them and clobbering them for good reason, but at any rate, that's what that sentence means there. Important additional mechanisms that may have contributed to death in this initial series of autopsies include a thrombotic microangiopathy that was restricted to the lungs. Thrombotic, that's clot. They're talking clots here. You're throwing around fancy big terms for a clot. Thrombotic means clots. Micro, small, angio, uh, those are blood vessels, angiopathy, uh, obviously ill sickness of the blood vessels. So the small blood vessels have clots in them, uh, but it was restricted to the lungs. So this would have been something different entirely and maybe more consistent with that idea of a bloodborne thing if there was this coagulation event and they, were, and they had noted in these autopsies that they were seeing these same clots in the microvasculature, which could include both... Um, uh, arteries, arterioles, veins, things like that. Uh, but we're seeing them as well, and maybe in the heart, in the liver, other places. They didn't notice, they didn't note that in here. In fact, they said they didn't see that. But in the lungs, thrombotic microangiopathy. Yep, that, that's what they saw. This process may involve activation of mega karyocytes. These are mega big uh, karyocytes. These are giant cells that um, are involved in uh, creating platelets. Uh, platelets are the things that, of course, are involved in creating clots in your blood. Possibly those native to the lung. Okay, so maybe these are megakaryocytes that were already in the lung. Maybe they wandered in there from somewhere else. Don't know. With platelet aggregation and platelet-rich clot formation, in addition to fibrin deposition. Now, fibrin, I'll, we'll get to this in just a second. When you get a clot, it's made up of uh, fibrin, a cross-linked fibrin. It's a protein. And so fibrin is an important part of the uh, clotting pathway. I'll show you that in just a second. So anyway, th they're just guessing here. This process may involve activation of megakaryocytes because I saw a bunch of them in here, possibly those native to the lung. Maybe they came from somewhere else. With platelet aggregation and a platelet-rich clot formation in addition to fibrin. So those are clots. Uh, very, very, fairly, fairly typical clot formation is what they're saying here. Small vessel thrombus formation, clot formation, in the lung periphery was in many cases associated with foci or local spots of alveolar hemorrhage. So the alveoli are hemorrhaging as well out in the periphery especially. In one case, extensive fibrin and early organization was present with degenerated neutrophils within the alveoli possibly representing neutrophil extracellular traps. So pretty wrecked lung tissue. Um, they're guessing a little bit on this one, uh, but at any rate, they, they saw they saw a bunch of neutrophils, which are uh, cells that, uh, white blood cells, when they show up, these are the things that, that can dump a lot of very toxic things to um, uh, to destroy cells and clean up um, you know bad areas that might have viruses in the cells, things like that. On RNA imaging, we were able to visualize multinucleated cells within alveolar spaces containing abundant RNA, likely representing virally infected cells. So I'm a little bit stumped what a multinucleated cell might be that's uh, kicked out into the alveolar space that's got a bunch of uh, viruses inside of it. Um, I don't have a, an answer for what that might be yet. I'll keep looking. These may represent multinucleated cells previously described from a single report of a postmortem biopsy from a decedent in China. And again, no clue what those might be. Cardiac findings were significant for a lack of myocarditis, and the rise in BNP observed in at least one of our cases was likely due to acute right ventricle, ventricular um, dilatation. All right. Uh, yeah. Um, so 
there's something about, uh, we'll get to the right ventricle again in a second. The right ventricle, of course, is the one that pumps blood from receiving the venous blood from the body and pumps it to the lungs. So there's a reason um, that the right ventricle might be uh, really uh, overworked and uh, in this particular case. So at any rate, um, we'll get to that in a second too. The underlying cause, they saw, also saw a scattered atypical myocyte degeneration remains uncertain. So some of the heart cells, the myocytes, were degenerating. They didn't have a lot of answer for that. So before we get to their histology findings, I want to show you this is what normal lung tissue would look like. So this is a very, very thin slice. This is seen under a microscope. It's been stained in a certain way with certain stains. And when you look at this normal lung tissue under a microscope, these are the kinds of things you would see. This would be a big uh, bronchiole right here. This would be a big tube that would normally be expanding and contracting as air was coming in. Here's a, a fully um, extended bronchiole. Here's a blood vessel. So you can see there's smooth muscle right around the outside and, and uh, there's blood cells inside. These are the alveoli, all this Swiss cheese whole stuff. These are what normal alveoli look like and they have large empty spaces, air spaces, and they're trying to maximize the contact between the walls here, which is where the blood vessels are going to be going through very thin capillaries out here, uh, having maximum surface area contact with the air because you want O2 and CO2 exchange in these air sacs. So that's what these alveoli are. Here's another blood vessel. You can clearly see the blood cells in there. So let's zoom in just a tiny bit, get a little closer on that. Again, normal lung tissue. This is a, a, um, uh, a bronchiole here. These are the cilia in here. So if you're breathing in, you see these little cilia, the little hairs right along the surface here. Those are the things that would be sweeping all the dust back out. You know, the cilia are beating in, in this beautiful coordinated uh, array and pushing stuff back out of your lungs that might have gotten down there. So that's what a normal, healthy uh, bronchiole would look like. Again, big uh, alveolar and the alveolar walls. And you can even see the red blood cells in the capillary. See those little red things going around in there? So you can see the maximum amount of surface area contact here between the air and the red blood cells. That's the job of the lung. And here's some capillaries with uh, red blood cells inside of them. And with the capillaries, you can see there's just a thin lining of endothelial cells right around the inside of these things. That's what those little blue dots are, the nuclei of those endothelial cells. So that's what normal lung tissue looks like. I mean, if we zoom way in, here you can see it even more clearly. Um, here are the red blood cells, you know, coursing around through the edge of this whole thing. Here's a bronchiole. Um, there's some smooth muscle here. And so it looks like this. So that's why I just wanted to keep taking you through this so you just get used to the idea of seeing big open spaces, erythrocytes, red blood cells squeezing their way through these little tiny capillaries, picking up oxygen, dumping off carbon dioxide, doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, some macrophages, some white blood cells right here, and uh, indicating the two type of alveolar sac uh, uh, cells that exist here, type 1 pneumocytes and type 2 pneumocytes. So that's normal tissue. So take a deep breath. Here's what uh, a SARS-CoV-2 patient's lungs look like on autopsy, and it's just a horrific mess. Um, this is so crammed up, uh, you, you can understand why having air exchange is very, very difficult to achieve. It's almost very, it's almost impossible to see what's really happening, but this would be an alveolar, alveoli sac right here, but it's full of it's full of cells. It's full of, um, in this case, on this side, we can see red blood cells out here. So they said hemorrhage out into the alveolar spaces. Um, here you can see a little more of the alveolar spaces, but look at all the cell debris that's uh, in here. So this is fully, fully pretty much ruined um, alveolar spaces. And uh, you can tell just very easily, there's really no chance of, of air exchange in this sort of a lung tissue relative to healthy lung tissue with all of its big wide open spaces and healthy looking um, bronchial and, and things like that. But this is just, just destroyed. Um, and as well, uh, what they saw it here was um, uh, these things called fibrin clots. So here's a, a kind of a stain. There's different kinds of stains you can use. And so when they use this uh, Masson trichome stain, what you see is that that bluish color, it's actually staining for extracellular fibrin. So again, ruined lungs all full in here, and it's full of all this blue stuff. What is that? That's what clots are made out of. 
So let's look at clotting again very quickly. Super complicated cascade, you know, the, for the body to clot, it's got to have a bunch of signals that it needs. Of course, because you don't want your blood clotting when it shouldn't, right? And you definitely want it to clot when it should. So very, very tightly regulated. I, you know, you don't have to remember all this. It's not going to be on the test tomorrow. But look all the way down here at the very end of this whole thing. What do you get? Fibrinogen, which is an enzyme, converts um, a fibrinogen, uh, the, the precursor protein gets converted by an enzyme into fibrin. And then you have this stable fibrin clot. So when you have a blood clot, if you looked at that under a microscope, there'd be a lot of fibrin in there and there would be platelets and that, you know, that's sort of the, the, the function of a clot. So that's what they're seeing in these lungs is all these lungs, all this territory in here is all clotted up and, in, and there's clots inside of these blood vessels as well. So when they say microthrombus, there's um, little clots, micro, small thrombus clots. There's clots everywhere out here. So very, very difficult to move oxygen into and out of uh, these sorts of lungs. Uh, as well, you can, I hope you can appreciate that if it looks like this, forcing more air into a lung that's this damaged using a ventilator is uh, going to be creating possibly more damage as well because of just how destroyed this all is. Um, and, you know, a healthy, a healthy cell, uh, a healthy alveolar sac, you know, it's got this really, um, very beautiful arrangement here and everything's all healthy, but when it's not, it's sort of cracked and broken and crud in there and there's red blood cells and there's fibrin and, uh, it's just a mess. So the lungs are, are pretty well ruined. So, uh, the, why is, why is this clotting happening? Um, why are these, uh, why are the blood vessels themselves leaking and hemorrhaging like this? Maybe, maybe one path. I just want to remind everybody here that when we look at the tissue distribution of the ACE2 protein, which is one of the two receptors that the honey badger virus likes to bind to and gets in, uh, right down here, I just want to point out to this part, um, ACE2 was present in arterial and venous endothelial cells in arterial smooth muscle cells in all organs studied. Uh, in conclusion, ACE2 is abundantly present in humans in epithelia of lung and small intestine. Remember, people sometimes have that um, uh, diarrhea as a an upset stomach as a presenting issue, which might provide possible routes of entry for uh, SARS-CoV. Um, and uh, I'm going to guess that uh, we're going to see the same distribution for SARS-CoV-2. All right. This epithelial expression together with the presence of ACE2 in the vascular endothelium also provides a first step in understanding um, how this might go for SARS. So I think this is also going to prove to be true for SARS-CoV-2. What is the endothelium? This is a blood, these are your blood vessels. You got arteries, you got veins. The arteries take the big pressure of, um, being carried away from the heart under, under high pressure out to the body and also out to the lungs. And uh, so you have this first lining, which is the endothelial cells, this little row right on the inside. And they make a nice tight pipe that doesn't leak Outside of the artery, a big, thick band of smooth muscle cells to give that nice um, the pipe a lot of tension. Uh, a lot less smooth muscle cells in a vein because it's a lot lower pressure. And um, But still, a nice tight pipe with those endothelial cells creating a full wall. And in veins as well, you have these little um, valves because the, the, the stuff's got to come whoop, and uh, like a check valve in plumbing. It's going to uh, allow the blood to flow one way but not back the other direction. And so um, this is what a blood vessel close-up might look like with those endothelial cells just lining it very perfectly like this. Red blood cells in the lumen in the open part of the pipe and then smooth muscle all the way around, okay? And so again, um, ACE2 is present in these arterial and venous endothelial cells and arterial smooth muscle cells. So um, here in these cells and here. So if ACE2 is present here and here, and um, this isn't in the lung, by the way. This is coming out of a different part of the body, but it's a nice picture of a, of a blood vessel. So I thought I'd throw it, throw it in here. But if it turns out that uh, the virus is attacking through the ACE2 mechanism and is, is attacking these endothelial cells directly, that might begin to explain some of this as well. But there are certainly a lot of um, clotting, uh, cast clotting issues showing up here. So the autopsy's conclusions from this is that this COVID-19, it causes clots, these thrombi, uh, to form in the lungs. So it could lead to hypercoagulability. Um, uh, 
which uh, just means that that uh, it's possible that what's happening here is it's initiating a clotting cascade, and that's part of the problem here. And maybe direct damage to the end, endothelial cells themselves, uh, and that's causing the leakage uh, that we're seeing and, and the hemorrhage out in there. Hard, don't know yet, still looking for what's going on there. It strongly suggests that the lung microvascular thrombosis that we're seeing here plays a role in that progressive, if not crashing, respiratory failure that's a signature of this. You know, people are fine, they're fine, then they're not fine, right? Um, and uh, this autopsy also noted that the right ventricle was really distended. Um, and so the right ventricle of the heart, uh, an idea, a theory here is that it, it's really stress, is it's trying to pump out towards the lungs, but it's trying to pump through clogged pipes, so all those blood vessels, right? And so that really fits the clinical observation of the heart's working really hard, beating hard, beating fast. But that's because the heart is trying really hard to get that blood out to the lungs, but the lungs are all clogged up um, because they've, they're just in this uh, heavily destroyed state. And so the, the heart's just pushing against that and getting nowhere um, with that. And uh, it also uh, fits with the sudden patient crashing, this decompensation, right? It suggests that there's maybe some sort of a trigger that all of a sudden causes this sudden coagulation event. Um, and now the good news, uh, let me see what I'm going to do here with this. Yeah, I got to get rid of this one here. I'll get to that next. Um, so the good news is uh, clinicians are all over this. So this just came out on um, the 13th of, uh, that's yesterday. And so what these people had noted clinically, uh, incidents of thrombotic or clotting complications in critically ill ICU patients with COVID-19, um, the conclusion was they found a 31% incidence of thrombotic complications in ICU patients with COVID-19, and that was remarkably high. It's way above baseline. Our findings reinforce the recommendation to strictly apply pharmacological thrombosis prophylaxis in all COVID-19 patients admitted to the ICU and are strongly suggestive of increasing prophylaxis towards high prophylactic doses, even in the absence of randomized evidence. Clinical speak for, you know, uh, these thrombotic complications, the clotting complications are pretty bad. And uh, you may want to just start people on anticoagulation therapies early and often. And uh, as well, this at turns out it's a really strong predictor for bad clinical outcomes, um, something the DIC score, and DIC stands for Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation, DIC. And there's all these different parameters. Um, you know, platelet counts is part of the parameter. D-dimer, which is a, a, um, a degradation product when fibrin is broken back down again by the body. It uh, releases something called D-dimer. So um, the more of this D-dimer you have, uh, the worse it's going to be. Uh, the, you know, if your platelet counts have crashed to under a certain level, you get a higher score. Fibrinogen, um, if your fibrinogen, which is the activating enzyme, which is creating the fibrin itself, if that's uh, under, a certain, under a certain level, you get a higher score here. And then your prothrombin time prolongation, which is a, a clotting factor time, if it takes too long, uh, you get a higher score here as well. So if you have a score over five, over five here, um, data published by hematologists from Wuhan, China, indicates that abnormal coagulation parameters can be a useful predictor of prognosis in pneumonia due to COVID-19. Although the numbers in this study are small, the results demonstrate that 71% of non-survivors, that'd be dead people, had overt DIC, as demonstrated by the International Society in Thrombosis and Hematitis, DIC score. Okay, compared with only 0.6% of survivors. So if if you've got these crashed platelet counts, uh, your D-dimer is, is uh, up high, you got a high level of that, your fibrinogen's down low, and your prothrombin time is really long, um, this is this associates uh, very strongly with people who crash and burn and then end up becoming a non-survivor, as they say here. So this coagulation event, very interesting finding confirmed now in uh, pathology. But the clinicians, as I mentioned, are all over this and really starting. There's tons of papers out now in the last uh, week or so that are talking about treating the coagulation as part of this. As I mentioned, this is a real honey badger of a virus. It's very complex. The, the treatment uh, protocols for this are exceedingly complex, and it's going to be a, uh, a long time before we really figure out all the subtle details of how this is working, but just absolutely magnificent work being done by clinicians 
to figure all this out and unravel it. Uh, moving on, I just want to remind you to wash your hands. Why? Because while I was researching this, I found uh, expression of ACE2 in different oral sites. So though that would be the oral tongue. I guess that's compared to um, the other tongues you might have. I'm not clear what, what that means. Floor of mouth, base of tongue, other sites. Um, so other sites in, uh, in the mouth. So, but look at this, ACE2, pretty high uh, expression all through there. This comes from a very recent Nature article here. Remember, uh, if you don't wash your hands, you run the risk of transferring uh, this virus into your mouth where actually it has receptors that it can bind to. It's distributed all over the body. And what's interesting to me about this is uh, looking at the amount of ACE2 expression here. Remember, this was about a six, we'll call it on average. Um, six would be here. Uh, so there's uh, the intestine has way more ACE2 receptors in it. The kidney has a wide range. Stomach, a very wide range. Bile ducts got a bunch in there. Liver has a bunch, but we didn't note any liver, uh, overt liver pathology in the autopsy reports that just came out. The oral cavity is here, which we just noted. Uh, but the lung, the lung's kind of middle of the zone here, but this is where it's getting clobbered. So there's clearly something going on besides just ACE2 distribution to just to describe why and how the damage is happening. Possibly it's just the lung is very, very fragile tissue. It's a very delicate structure uh, because of its architecture, having all of that, you know, uh, empty space in there because it needs to do that because that's its job. Uh, maybe it's that, but uh, somehow in the lung, uh, the way that the immune system is recruited there and the damage is focusing there, it can't just be explained by the amount of ACE2 that it's got. It's uh, That's because this is right in the middle of the zone here. But notice that, um, yes, uh, esophagus, uh, bladder, uh, uh, uterus, prostate, so ACE2 is everywhere. So there's a chance here for this virus to bind and, and get into the body in a variety of ways and interact with it in a variety of ways. And we're getting more and more um, data that it's also able to get into the central nervous system as well or into nerve tissue. All right. That's what we got on the pathology slash autopsy finding sides. And it's a coagulation event. Uh, we're going to do this real shift here. I mean, where else can you come for a video like this where you are going to get uh, both a, a tour through the histology findings from autopsies as well as a quick little peek at the economy? Uh, by the way, I've got, I just can't let this go without talking about it. The the Federal Reserve and the banks, they're really – they're just not on our side. And, and people are starting – Sheila Baer, former um, uh, FDIC executive – uh, and I a lot of respect for Sheila Bear. I think she's done actually done a really good job uh, through things. I, I disagree with her um, assessment that she had in this article that the Fed's done a heroic job. I think the Fed's doing a, a mysterious job that's actually not heroic at all. And uh, she says here, the mystery behind the Fed's refusal to suspend bank dividends. Ah, man, this thing is really annoying. This just came out today. The $2.2 trillion stimulus bill recently passed by Congress sensibly restricts large companies getting help under that bill from distributing capital to shareholders or paying outsized executive compensation, right? And that's fair. You get that, right? If the taxpayers are going to be throwing a ton of money at these companies, well, then don't the C, the C-suite people, the CEOs, they ought not to be rewarding themselves and paying shareholders, right? That makes sense. These restrictions are not punitive towards shareholders and executives. Rather, they reflect the obvious. Struggling companies should prioritize payroll, and other operational costs until the crisis passes. Cash payouts to shareholders and executives are not a good use of precious capital right now. But that same rationale also applies to the nation's largest banks, which are getting substantial government help from the Federal Reserve. Ironically, U.S. regulators, that's code speak for the Federal Reserve, are going in the opposite direction. A few weeks ago, they appropriately gave large banks permission to dip into supplemental capital buffers designed to give them the ability to expand their balance sheets in times of stress. Okay, that's fine. So, But they're going to run down that, that cushion a little bit. So they gave them, okay, you can, you've got your rainy day funds, banks. You can dip into that. Go for it. But then they eased the rules already in place that would have effectively required the biggest banks to stop shareholder payouts and discretionary bonuses once they dipped into those buffers. So what? The regulators were concerned, that's the Federal Reserve, was concerned that big banks would be disincentivized to expand lending capacity if that meant it had to stop paying dividends and bonuses. Oh, my God. 
What a bunch of wussies here. Oh no, if they can't pay themselves outrageous bonuses, they might not feel like doing their jobs. They might not feel like earning their $7 million salaries if they can't pay themselves $8 million possibly. Is that what's being said here? Yep, that's exactly what is being said here. Uh, But if that was actually a problem, the simplest solution, Sheila writes, would be to do what European and British regulators have done. Just tell the banks they had to stop paying dividends and bonuses, whether they use their capital buffers or not. Boom, done. Bang, right? But no, just right. The Federal Reserve was concerned that the big banks would be disincentivized to expand lending capacity if it meant they had to stop paying dividends and bonuses. Oh, my God. This is horrifying. This is horrifying. The Federal Reserve, I it, this is pitchforks and torches time. This is fourth turning material. This is absolutely grotesque. And Sheila's written it in a very loving way, in a very nice way, very euphemistically. Lots of big words in here. But the bottom line is this isn't a mystery. The mystery is that people haven't like, you know, brought out the 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 flamethrowers on this. But let's go to exhibit B that the Fed is actually the problem here, not the friend and, uh, that you want. This is also from today. The Fed's high-yield ETF buying defies explanation, writes a Bloomberg, Brian uh, uh, Brian for uh, Bloomberg here, right? Uh, cutting into the center of the article, uh, talking about um, uh, the uh, testimony by this guy here. Indeed, Fed Vice Chair Richard Clarita made a similar point in a Bloomberg TV interview view with Tom Keene and Michael McKee on Monday, saying, quote, several important companies in the U.S. were in, were investment grade up until the crisis hit. And what we said in our programs, if they've been downgraded after the date of the crisis, they will have access to these new facilities. That all sounds reasonable so far. I think moral hazard in past circumstances when it's been associated with financial excesses or private sector excesses is obviously something to assess and think about. But in this case, this is an entirely exogenous event. Businesses aren't closing and people aren't unemployed due to any fault of their own. And I think this is as clear a possible case that those aren't relevant considerations. Well, that sounds reasonable, except the problem, Fed Vice Chair Richard Clarita, is that the Fed isn't just extending credit to formerly investment grade companies. As uh, uh, Brian uh, Chapata writes here, none of Clarita's comments directly justify the Fed buying high yield ETFs. For one, the largest such fund, BlackRock Inc.'s $15.8 billion iShares iBox High Yield Corporate Bond Fund, ticker HYG, had roughly one third of its asset invested in single B rated debt and 11.3% in securities rated triple C or double C as of April 9th. Those hardly qualify as crucial American firms. As a reminder, BlackRock will manage assets for both the Fed's credit facilities. Oh, so BlackRock is managing assets for the Fed and the Fed jumps in and buys a crashing junk bond fund off of BlackRock, not not at par, meaning what it's actually worth, but above par. There is nothing in this, but this is just a direct bailout of BlackRock who had a fund that they put together that was stinking up the joint because it was invested before the crisis hit in crappy, junky companies. Again, these hardly qualify as crucial American firms. I'll, I'll be more blunt than that. The, none of these firms slipped into junk credit rating because of the crisis. They were in junk status despite 10 years of economic expansion in Fed pumping of the markets and the credit markets. So this is horrifying. This is awful stuff where you know individuals are going bankrupt by the millions right now. Mortgages are upside down. And what is the Fed doing? Well, it's riding to the rescue of a of a of an esoteric high yield high risk bond fund that frankly should have you know you get risk and reward go together you have a high risk fund it gets high re- returns and that's fine when all's fun and games but then you know what sharp sticks somebody's going to lose an eye and uh sharp stick comes along and next thing you know this fund ought to lose money but the fed wrote in and said no that would be unfair we wouldn't want this fund to lose money we're going to buy this fund. There's nothing in the in the Fed's charter that allows it to do that, but here it is doing it. And remember, um, pennies for Main Street, trillions for Wall Street. Look at this. Look at this. This is what the Fed's doing. They're printing trillions and trillions of dollars. This is the Fed balance sheet, right? Um, and uh, now over $6 trillion. If you told me that 20 years ago, 
I would have said, nah, you're nuts. If you told me that 10 years ago, I'd be like, nah, you're still nuts. Uh, and here we are. Uh, so this is crazy. And as a reminder, the gap between these two lines right here is about $800 billion, right? That's about an $800 billion line right there. Uh, that's how much the Fed's balance sheet had grown from all of history, from its inception in 1913 through to 2007. And now it just created that literally in a couple of weeks. So, you know, more than 100 years of, of growth or about 100 years of, of growth in its balance sheet has now been ramped up in just a couple of weeks. Why? Well, because, you know, BlackRock's uh, high-yield bond fund might be losing a little money. And uh, the banks are going to, you know, we would want them. They're going to have to pay dividends and bonuses if we want them properly incentivized to do their jobs, which is called making loans, right? Anyway, this is all a bunch of junk, you know, finances, a uh, uh, junky area. It's just been turned into a, a monkey show by the Federal Reserve. Thanks, guys and gals. But um, – and stocks are up strongly again today, but I'm I'm here to tell you this is a sell all rallies kind of a, a moment here still. Why? Because forget stocks. There's only one uh, real uh, asset you need to track, and the actions in oil. And here there was this you know huge. This was one of the largest single day gains in oil in all of its history. That little green bar right there, and it's almost entirely gone now today, uh, in the last two days. But today it's it's really crashing again. Why? Because the cuts out of OPEC aren't even su remotely sufficient to account for the lack of demand in oil. Oil is the master resource. Uh, and the action oil tells you everything about the true state of the economy. This is the true state of the economy right here. Um, this is a bunch of hocus pocus junk. This is a bunch of this, this really is, should be illegal and ought to be a criminal activity. And I'm hoping there's trials someday. And this is just this is just insulting. All right. So that, that's how that all stacks together. By the way. This chart right here leads to this statement right here. Hey, plant a garden. Uh, you're really going to want to plant a garden. This level of economic destruction comes with all sorts of unintended, unknown consequences. It's a complex system. We can't predict everything that's going to happen, of course. But it will have emergent behaviors. And one of them is uh, possibility of food insecurity, food risk. That's a small possibility. But um, more than that, I want you to have access to healthy food. And uh, growing your own food is, is a real it's a way to take some of the control back from the system and eat better in the process. So go ahead forth and do that if you can. Conclusions for today. Uh, SARS-CoV-2. It causes a coagulation storm for some reason. Got to get more data about why that is. Clinicians are already treating that and uh, hopefully doing that very successfully. If that coagulation storm hits, if it does, the outcome is really poor from that moment onward. If you have a DIC of over 5, that's your predictor of a very bad outcome. Um, so that's something to really uh, just note and uh, keep an eye on. And remember, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. It's a number of things that go together into that. But if your DIC is over five, that shows up pretty poorly. The lung, dan the lung that's where most of the damage is seen on autopsy by far. I want to see a lot more autopsy results because uh, we really need to burrow in and look and, you know, because there'll be people who died suddenly. There'll be people who had this for a long time. There'll be people who died, you know, months after having it. We want to have the autopsy findings to see and know, really to confirm everything that we're seeing in the, in the clinic. Uh, and so the autopsy is not just sort of curiosity. It's really important to confirm clinically what we're seeing uh, in the effects on the organs themselves. So um, that those pathological findings are really actually pretty important. But so far, what we see is it's not equally distributed throughout the body. So yes, there is this disseminated coagulation, which means it, you can find it all over the body. And indeed, they found um, thrombosis, uh, thrombi all throughout the body. But um, it really, the lung is where this con damage is concentrated. Switching gears, the Fed behaving poorly. Again, bailing out the banks, the big financial firms, its friends and family, the wealthy. Same as in 2008, only worse this time. Way worse. They're not even trying to hide it. This is so unsubtle. <laughs> Every other company can't pay out shareholders and outsized, outsized executive compensation. But banks, go for it. We wouldn't want you to be disincentivized. <laughs> <laughs> That's just awful. Uh, the price of oil says everything about the economy. It says it's in foul shape right now. All this printing by the Fed is just a last grab for cash. Actually, it's a massive wealth transfer. You know who the largest landlord in all of America is right now? It's the Federal Reserve. How did they become the largest landlord? What work did they perform? They didn't perform any work. They clickety-clickety-clicked on their keyboard and uh, bought all these mortgage-backed securities. And so now they are, by far, 
the largest landlord uh, on the basis of that. That's why banks have to be very carefully regulated, and we shouldn't just treat them as if they are magicians of some sort. They're not. They're people, which means they have conflicts of interest, and they do really dumb things like help their friends, bail their friends out, uh, help their friends not have to suffer any consequences and take big bonuses and all that other stuff, right? So that's what I'm seeing right now. Hey, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. Hi, folks. Adam Taggart here. Chris Martinson and I are the co-founders of Peak Prosperity. If you want to get alerted whenever we release a new video from Chris, just click the red subscribe button right beneath the YouTube video player. Once you've done that, a little bell icon will appear right next to it. Click on that bell. It looks like this. And that's it. The next time we publish a video from Chris, you'll immediately receive a notification from YouTube. Thanks for watching our videos.